So, um, so here we go. Um, so again, uh, thanks for tuning in on a Tuesday night. I know it's kind of weird, Super Tuesday and all. A lot of you maybe are following or maybe not following the, the circus of an election that's about to occur here. But um, so it's a big, big night for many states. So if you're coming home from voting, thanks for uh, joining us. If you're not, that's okay too. Um, but tonight we're going to go and uh, just do a, a first of a two-part series uh on a webinar re regarding acceleration of uh, orthodontic care and how to do it safely. And it's going to, by, by many means, it's going to be a, a, a background for you to kind of understand uh, a little bit about how all this works and where I'm coming from. And if you tune in for part two, which is going to come right before the AAO meeting, the American Association of Orthodontics meeting in, in April, um, you'll see I'll have a last, lot more case content. So I do have two very nice cases to show you tonight. I think they're both um, very worthy of looking at. Um, you can learn a lot from both of them, and, um, and there's quite a bit to um, see on both. So, so here we go. So again, thank you for tuning in. So uh, tonight, you know, my name is Neil Warshawski, and uh, I'm an orthodontist, and I, I practice in Chicago. And you know, my my goal is going to be to kind of take you through my journey, uh, so you understand. Uh, a little bit about myself, you know, I'm a, I'm a born and bred, you know, U University of Illinois uh, um, person, you know, I, I now teach in the dental school there. Um, I started a practice back in 1992. We've been relatively successful here in Chicago, um, establishing a, a pretty boutique -y style uh, practice that does some, some very high-end work. So, um, you know, so, so this whole concept of Propel really fit. Um, everything that we do because we have a lot of um, educated people in the city here. Not everybody, you know, is like a professional, but many of the patients we see are, are very educated. They're doing their homework and they're really asking for a lot from the orthodontic perspective. They're asking for cosmetic work. They're asking to be done quickly. They're, be, uh, they're asking to be done safely. And uh, these are things that are uh, easy to request, but they're hard to deliver on. So. Uh, I'm going to joke around a little bit and suggest to you that uh, I'm not a superhero, and sometimes I think it's it's really hard to explain to people why what they're requesting is unreasonable. So when I started orthodontics back in the 90s, um, it was quite a different concept. You know, everybody was using twin brackets and um, you went to a two, and it was just starting to merge into a three-year specialty program where you learn the craft of orthodontics, the art of orthodontics, and it was um, it was a pretty tall request um, to get out of the program, have enough cases finished to even take your boards, and um, you know, and, and get out of there and and emotionally be in one piece. So. Um, you know, so I, I, I was uh, trained very conservatively to use sliding mechanics and uh, twin brackets, and we were in an 18 slot, you know, and clear liners didn't exist. So, um, so that was the world, you know, 20 some odd years ago. Today, um, it doesn't work like that at all. You know, you don't have to be an orthodontist in order to do orthodontics at all. And um, people come in and they ask for some really extreme things, and you know, in terms of whether it's speed or safety or uh, appearance, um, sometimes they want us to move teeth in areas where there's no bone. Uh, it can be very difficult. So I think, from my perspective, you know, I am the shepherd of the care of many patients throughout the course of the month, almost 1,600 a month. And uh, many of these are anything but slam dunks. So it's it's really concerning for my staff and I to to do things safely, and we and we try to explain to people that just because you pay for something and it costs a dollar doesn't mean that you can have the same thing if three people all come to the counter and they each have a dollar, because your physiology will dictate your range and your ability to move safely and stuff like that. So 
I don't know if any of you have seen this, but this is a viable company that does clear aligner therapy that has basically decided to bypass the doctor. So in this scenario, when you join the Smile Care Club, you can literally have a visit from a hygienist or someone with a scanner and they can scan your teeth and they can give digital impression without you ever going to an office and they can deliver clear aligner therapy to your home without ever even seeing a doctor. So I don't know how uneasy that makes you feel, but uh, I can tell you that really kind of makes me feel very uneasy because uh, I, I would never want to have that type of assumption that um, a non-person can design my care because I, who knows who's designing it. You know, they're certainly not going to be responsible and they're certainly not going to be credibly able to come to the phone and respond to your issues if you have problems. So, uh, But these are the types of pressures that are now leaning on practices, not just mine. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a dental practice or an orthodontic practice. These, these types of pressures just absolutely um, will put a lot, of, a lot of stress on a practice. So I think, you know, today stress is going to come in many different forms from how we originally trained. And I don't know about you, but when I think about stress, you know, I think of the minions. I think of the minions being happy, but, but then, you know, you got companies like this that are trying to compete for my patients, and, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, like, you know, really? Is this, is this how things are going to go? that you know people are going to get care and they won't even see a professional that's insane so you know we're, we're starting to offer new solutions so um, if you keep an eye on the future I did write an article it's called the stress of it all it's gonna be coming out in the first quarter this year and it it kinda of talks about all these things about you know just the life cycle of your practice from coming out of dental school or specialty school and starting your practice or joining a practice to growing your patient base to learning to mature your office, improve your office, improve your 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 people skills, learning to the, the art of the cell, how to talk to people and make them feel comfortable and make people understand that your interest is their interest. So um, I kind of go through the whole thing right down to when you're done with your career and you got to now sell your practice. So um, my, my article I thought was really kind of a cute twist on um, how the world's changed and uh, keep an eye out for it. You'll be able to, uh, you know, if you get the Benson Clark letter, it's going to be in there for sure, an abbreviated version of it. And I'm, I'm sure as I'm talking to you now, if you go to the, the AAO meeting, you may found, find that um, they'll probably be handing it out in like form of a white paper. So, you know, the dissemination of info has really changed and it's changing again as we're now able to digitally create care, whether that's through scanners or, you know, making clear liners or 3D printing of models or, you know, CAT scans and, you know, cone beams and um, digital x-rays and digital photography and, you know, so it's, you know, everything is just coming at you faster now and you're processing more and more accurate data every year and, um, you know, there's less and less room actually for error and, you know, and appliances as a result fit even tighter and tighter. So, so, you know, so it's really come down to the patient's desires now is really desiring how you're going to actually create a treatment plan to suffice their, their requests. So when we when we talk about the art of the cell in, in the orthodontic world, you know, I, I'm very convinced and I've been talking about this subject now for about five years, that really customized care kind of rules now. And customized care means that you can you can you can really customize your care based on looks, comfort, or speed, right? The cost is the one thing that will be a, a result of how you customize it, but you know, so cost is really a part of the customization as well. So when we talk about this, you know, when we talk about the aesthetics of orthodontics, we now say, hey, you know, 
what's our options here? Um, you know, we have, you know, for, for good looks now, we have lingual orthodontics, we have um, uh, indirect bonding trays to make brackets go on more accurately and, and actually quicker in the patients in the chair loss. Um, we now have lots and lots of clear aligner systems, and that that is, you know, the, the cork's just about to blow off on that bottle over the next two years as, um, as we see the, the patterns start to wear down at the Invisalign level and, you know, because they're by far, you know, leading the, the pack initially, you know, and they have for the last 16 years, 15, 16 years, but, you know, that's going to go away too. Um, you know, even, even wire technology, you know, there, there's been um, clear wires available now for a little while, and, and they work. They're not great, but they work, and cosmetically they're great on a clear bracket. So, you know, people really have some really very, very what I would call um, accurate and aesthetically pleasing options in terms of looks. Comfort's a big one, though, and, and I can't stress this one enough on an adult because adults tend to be, you know, a little wimpy. They're not like kids. They don't tolerate things nearly as well. Um, they, they tend to complain a lot. They tend to um, feel like, you know, like this shouldn't bother me, but, you know, sometimes they don't know what they're getting themselves into, so it's, it's important from a comfort perspective that you have to be able to... Um, Make sure a person not only understands where they're coming from, but in addition to where they're coming from, but what they can expect on the journey, on the on the on the path. Because if they don't understand what's going to happen, then at the end of the day, you're going to let them down. So adults, unlike kids, probably will not have a lot of tolerance for that. Like if you let them down one time, once maybe they may they may say, "I'm done." And, and they may quit on you because they lose their confidence. So, you know, we refer to that as the blind confidence. And that blind confidence is the thing that gets people into your office. So whether they're reading reviews on Google or um, they're coming because their neighbor went to you or they thought you had a cute logo or, or they just walk by your office every day and it looks inviting. You just never, never, never want to undermine that that belief that you're going to shepherd their care and take care of them. But from a comfort standpoint now, we now have some technology that we can throw at them, okay? Um, you know, pulse tile technology, that's, you know, the Acceladon system's been around for a while. Um, there's a new one out called BioPulse, which is, uh, which is uh, an infrared light that, you know, works very well as well. Um, there's pharmacology as well, which is there's long-acting uh, non steroidals that you can give people. Uh, there's Wilkodonics, which causes, you know, a purposeful inflammation. Tonight we're going to talk about microosteoperforations, which are targeted microtraumas, which also help to uh, cause areas of, um, we'll say, bone morphology to respond in a traumatic way so that they temporarily soften. So, you know, this is really, this whole comfort thing really is, is fascinating to me. And I think it's one of the hottest, by far one of the hottest markets in the orthodontic world, simply because of the fact that it is affordable and, and people are willing to pay uh, to go faster and be more comfortable. So cost is a tough one, though, because, you know, people, you know, if they're savvy, they... Um, can Google prices now. And the thing that I always tell people is, you know, I've never held a million dollars. It, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I've just never held it. And if something is $1,000 in the office down the street and it's $3,000 in my office, it doesn't mean that they're the same and it doesn't mean that I'm just more expensive. What I always tell people is, in a good quality care office, you get what you pay for. And I like to think that's exactly what we demonstrate in our, in our practice, that we represent the, the hierarchy of high-end orthodontic care. And we do it at every level from, from the HIPAA record system that we keep online to the patient visit in the office to, you know, we just do whatever we can to make their visit good. And and this is really, you know, this goes into the cost. And, and whether people understand that or not, 
if you shoot a high quality x-ray in my office and you don't have to get it printed on paper because we can Dropbox it or we can share file it to another practice, that's a huge cost savings for you in terms of effort. You know, and that comes down to the fact that we had to pay to put a system in place. And all these little platforms, if you will, all these tools that we use, they all cost money. And it's not unreasonable to think that, well, you know, we're going to spend some money here to take care of people, but uh, our goal is that we're going to do it right. Now, speed is a really, this is the thing that's really kind of changed my practice in the last five years. I sell speed absolutely. And, and I'm unashamed to tell you, like, I think I do it better than most practices because I just understand it really well and I've made it my business to understand it. So we sell speed at many, many different levels. We sell it in the appliance design, we sell it in pharmacology, we sell it in science, we sell it in, you know, whether it's photomodulation or, you know, you know, soft pulse technology, micro perforations, decorticating surgical sites, custom made appliances, removable appliances, you name it, we offer it. And it's the one thing I don't think you can follow me on. We offer everything. And that's part of how we make people happy. Our goal is going to always be to try and give people a diverse menu. From the menu, you will kind of decide your, your outer limits of what you can and cannot do. And then we design your therapy. So again, looks, comfort, and speed, in my world, that represents something called ultimate orthodontics. And if you want all three, it's not a problem. You know, this is what we do. We know this is a hot topic. It's been on the cover of the American Journal of Orthodontics more than once. We've had joint meetings now with the Periodontal Association. Everybody has talked about this. You know, the Wilco brothers have offered their course, boy, probably over 10 years, 12 years now. And it's still well attended by, like, multiple countries, not just people within the U.S. You know, this is now moving over from being an orthodontic thing into being uh, a dental thing. So, so we're really looking at trying to get educated uh, individuals to choose what's really properly best for them. So these patients, we call them digital omnivores. So digital omnivores are patients who, um, you know, they have, you know, uh, a smartphone, they have a computer, they have an iPad. You know, these are people who do their research. They go on Google. They look things up. You know, they read reviews. They, they ask, you know, to, to meet patients that have, that have done this. And, and one of the things that's common, it doesn't really matter whether you're in Ardmore, Oklahoma, or um, you're in Chicago, Illinois, or you're in, you know, the tip of Oregon. You can be on a boat in the Pacific. It really doesn't matter. Everybody values their time today. It's the one premium that you, you can't take out of a package. And reducing the time but giving people um, the best result that's achievable in a safe and effective manner, it's priceless. You know, people are willing to pay for that. And I think if you learn to do this, what happens is you get a, um, a little bit of, a, of an outlier position where people start to look at you and say, oh, you know, that's, if you need to do this, you, you got to go see that practice because they're good at doing tough problems. They're, they're good at making things go quickly, safely. So you get a reputation, good or bad, as uh, being different in all the practices, and that's kind of where I think we've set ourselves. So when, you know, we talk about speed, you know, I told you, we, we definitely sell speed in our practice. People really like speed a lot. I mean, it, it really, you know, if you said to an adult, well, you need comprehensive orthodontics, you know, the first thing they're going to think of is what they know orthodontics to be, and it's going back to when they were 13 and their buddies and girlfriends all had braces. You know, that's what they think. Now, that's not necessarily what we're selling today, but that's what they think. So if you say, well, yeah, it's going to take two and a half years or three years, maybe they had a friend that had braces for four years, but, you know, in your case, Mrs. Jones, I can probably get your case done in nine months. Well, all of a sudden, you just spoke a you just spoke the unwritten language of love to them because they're going to love you if you can really do this in nine months. So I think that's kind of neat. 
So, and you know, the public, the public's all about speed. You know, people really like, you know, they're drawn to stuff like this. You know, we know from the movies that are the franchises that are popular, like the Fast and the Furious. You know, one of the big ones we watch over and over in our office is Iron Man. You know, do you know that the number one sport in America of all sports, number one sport is NASCAR? I had no idea. You know, so. And then, of course, you know, one of the pilgrimages in the Midwest is, you know, if you live in the Midwest, is the Indy 500. And, of course, you recognize a Corvette, which is, you know, like the, the epitified is the, the American muscle car that people dream to buy, you know, which is a very, you know, it's been around for, I don't know, since the 60s. So, you know, these are all speed. Speed's a sexy thing, you know, and people, people like the idea of speed. Well, you know, so here's a concept, whether you understand it or not. When you customize orthodontics, you can satisfy many people because custom orthodontics not only is more comfortable, it actually goes faster. Now, we, we know this to be true because the largest study in the United States was done by, and I believe it's still going on, is SureSmile. SureSmile, you know, had like tens of thousands of cases showing a reduction in speed. And these are not like cherry-picked cases. These were, these were anything that walked in the door and it just it showed that if you custom bent this arch wire, your case would go quicker. So we, we know this to be true. So custom ortho today has a lot of different meanings, right? You can custom make braces, you can custom make wires, you can custom make treatment times. I know it sounds weird, but you can. You can you can change your bracket design. You can use a twin bracket, or now you can use a self-ligation bracket. You can use an edgewise, but you can also use a ribbon arch. You know, there's a set of placing brackets directly. You can now do indirect bonding, where you know the brackets are in a tray, and then you're guaranteed that the position of the the bracket will be exactly what the lab had suggested. Um, but the most twisted one, and the one we've gotten really good at in our practice, is is the customization of physiology. So customized physiology is is breaking the rules and making the body respond differently. And that's something really new. So, you know, when, when you start thinking in terms of, you know, what kind of things you can do with that, well, I know, you know, from my own practice that if you surgerize an area and add a bone graft, you can make it go easier. So we, we refer to that as wilkodonics or fast ortho for short. If surgery is not as desirable, you know, you can go straight through the tissue with micro perforations, which we're going to talk a lot about tonight. And, and that's nice because there's no flap and there's no, you don't need a driver, you don't need anesthesia, you, you just get a little bit of, you know, like a numbing gel and, you know, it's usually enough to do the trick. Um, but if you're really like kind of wimpy and you don't want any type of invasiveness at all, you, you've got non-surgical options as well. You got, you know, pulsatile technology with the Acceladent system. You got infrared radiation using the Biopulse system. You have um, just a whole lot of weird science now that's that's actually a reality that, that can help you move along. And that goes on top of your custom-made brackets, whether you do, you know, like the Incognito system or the Harmony system or the um, the Damon system or uh, the Insignia system or the STB system, the Hero system, the modified Targ system, the Oropix system, the, you know, you name it, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of systems out there, um, all designed to make your mechanics go better, whether that's easier on the patient or easier on you, I'm not really sure, you know, you can be the decision on that. But for our purposes tonight, I want to keep it simple. I only want to really get in depth about and talk about the propel concept, you know, and then, you know, and that's the micro osteo perforations. And if we can concentrate on this tonight, I think, I think that would be good. So with propel or micro osteo perforations, what you're doing is you're creating a bone injury and bone injury is being done because um, you're effectively taking a, a small screw tip and just burying it in, into the tip of the bone creating a small hole or an irritation on the bone will increase your cytokinin production. Increasing your cytokinin production will allow the rate of the bone remodeling to increase and then your bone density will go down so that 
your body can fill the holes in, if you will. Okay? So that's a, a very, very, very basic version of how that works. Um, there's been a whole lot of research in this field. Uh, I don't want to make this all evidence-based because I'm afraid it'll get a little boring. Um, but I will say that um, there's been uh, a couple hallmark studies, um, Krishnan's study in 2005, um, Taguchi's study in 2008, all, all suggest that bone remodel, the, the rate of the bone remodeling is by the speed of the tooth movement, at least in orthodontics. You know, there's been um, a lot of energy and effort placed in the last five to seven years about trying to move teeth faster. Um, but the, the gist of it is, is in orthodontics, we know that tooth movement involves bone acquisition and bone resorption. And the denser the bone is, the slower the teeth would move. So if you could somehow soften the density of the bone, you would, you would initially cause a quicker orthodontic result to occur. And when this would occur, you can see increased rate of tooth movement uh, over twice as fast. So what we tell people is, is when you're accelerating your care, you can expect that your, your care can go up to 50% faster. And that's how we explain it to them. So um, the trick on all, all this is for the cytokinins to be effective, and there's a bunch of studies on the screen here for you to see, um, you really are not allowed to have any type of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in the area. So we give everybody a little postcard that explains what Propel is on the day they get it. And in that, um, we tell them that they're not allowed to have any uh, anti non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. We, we staple to that card a little brown coin envelope, but inside is two extra strength Tylenol. So we try to drive home the point to them that the only thing we want them taking is Tylenol, and that's during the whole six to eight week period following the uh, incident. After six or eight weeks, typically, assuming that the move isn't completed, we will re-injure the area and we'll re-perforate the area wherever we feel that we need it. Our goal will be to probably, on an average case, go two to three times. And we only do the areas that um, we need to see decreased uh, density in the bone. So, so literally, we create a map, if you will. That map will tell us where the injury is going to occur. And the lack of injury will almost be like an anchorage issue for me. Injuring the areas where I want the teeth to move easier, of course, is going to allow the teeth to move faster. So knowing that, that science, um, let's talk about how tooth movement actually occurs. So when a force is applied to a tooth, and you can see it in this case, there's a, a red arrow pushing on the tooth. It's going to go through the tooth, and it's going to force the tooth to move to the right. On the right side of the tooth, you have a pressure side because the tooth is being pushed into the bone. The periodontal ligament is going to get disorganized. It's going to get hyalinized, and the vascularity in that is going to get cut off. So that will cause uh, effectively cellular death, which is going to cause an undermining resorption to occur. Now, it's not really an undermining resorption, but bone, bone resorption will occur on this side of the tooth. Eventually, when that tooth moves away from the left side, you'll get a tension side, so that those fibers, the Sharpies fibers that go from the bone to the tooth, are going to pull on the yellow bone on the left side, and that's going to cause bone apposition to occur. So as that frontal resorption is occurring and the vascular constriction is occurring, your pressure side is actually resorbing the bone, creating space for your tooth to move towards the right. And as that occurs and your tooth moves to the right, your tension side is going to get pulled. When you push too hard on the tooth and you get true undermining resorption, instead of getting a bodily movement, what you see in this scenario is your tooth will tend to tip. So when a tipping occurs, 
you get a necrotic area temporarily between the tooth and the bone because the tissue just can't respond fast enough. And as a result, what you'll find is your teeth will physically bind on your arch wire, especially if you're using like a twin bracket here. And your mechanics will ultimately move at first, but then they tend to slow down and get stuck simply because you're, you're muscling the teeth. On the remodeling side then, you got all kinds of things going on, the pre-osteoblasts, which are going to lay down what will ultimately be the osteoblasts, and the osteoblasts are going to ultimately lay down the bone. So these, these all kind of are working in concert with the macrophages and the osteoclasts, which are on the resorption side, to kind of have this yin and yang concept where bones being added and subtracted simultaneously right next to each other, depending on whether it's press, pressing the tooth against the area or pulling the tooth away from it. So you go from resorption to reversal to formation of new bone and then ultimately mineralization of that new bone. And that osteoid-like bone becomes your new surface. So NYU did the original studies, and really, as far as I'm concerned, these were really very, very clean studies. And uh, it was the effects of microosteal perforations on the rate of tooth movement. These were the real studies that, that set, the, set the, the industry on its edge. So the goal was really take some extraction cases. One side of every adult was propelled, and one side was not. And then they just very carefully followed the results. And what they found was the sides that were propelled, that were microosteal perforated, demonstrated a 2.3-fold increase in the velocity of tooth movement, more than twice as fast as the non-perforated side. And this was canine retraction specifically from a TAD using nine tie springs. So the, the force, you know, was even. The TADs didn't move. And the conclusion of the study simply was that osteoperforating the bone was safe and comfortable. So the clinical trial demonstrated 2.3% uh, 2.3 fold increase in velocity, but the reality is it was actually greater than that. So the treatment time itself was reduced by almost 40%. And um, I'm sorry, 60%. And what was impressive here was that the teeth were, were bodily moved and they didn't show any tipping. So when you when you look and you see the amount of tooth movement per side, you can clearly see like on the bottom two photos here. In the middle, you'll see a space between the lateral and the canine. On the non-treated side, there was no space visible. From the occlusal photo, which is in the letter D here, you can actually see that the left side of the mouth was showing canine movement, and the right side, without the microosteal perforations, did not. So what they took away was the microosteal perforations made some significant changes in the movement of the teeth, but not every tooth responded the same way. So you had to look specifically and determine what you wanted to know. When it came to molar uprighting, the duration of treatment was almost twice as, twice as fast. When it came to canine retraction, almost twice as fast, maybe slightly faster. But pulling a molar forward on the bottom, this is a tooth that has four roots, was actually better than twice as fast. That responded better than anything else. And the intrusion of teeth also responded quite well. So depending on different types of moves, and these are not necessarily single-rooted teeth, they all showed good promise here. They all showed better than a 50% reduction in the tooth movement. So at some point, you have to say to yourself, well, this can't be an accident because there was 20 adults here being treated and they all respond in the same way. So now let's look and see what are our options here if somebody doesn't want to get perforated. What else can you do? 
So one of the newest ones that came out in August of last year is photobiomodulation. This is a device called Biopulse. It's, it's kind of a non-invasive accelerator. It takes about 10 minutes a day to do. So basically what you do is you put this thing in your mouth and it turns on automatically and after five minutes it beeps and you flip it so it goes from the upper to the lower. These little gold things inside this rubbery mouthpiece, these are all infrared lights. So basically what you're doing is you're bathing all the cellular tissue around your teeth with infrared light which is cranking all the ATP up in all the cell walls and basically you're overproducing ATP in the tissue around your teeth. So that's, that's in a nutshell how it works. This is similar to um, a lot of the other electronic devices where it comes in a case, the case is connected Wi-Fi, gives you results on how well you're going and you know how many days you've used it and how many minutes you used it. This is currently the fifth generation of the device. Um, they've you know altered the shape and the number of uh, LEDs that they've used inside of it. Um, and this came out in November's generation number five. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, biggest thing about this is it's super expensive. It's a, it's a thousand dollars, and it's a Canadian company. So if you buy product, it has to be imported. And uh, I don't know about you, but we've we've had some issue getting these. They do work though. There's there's no question these do work. So photobiomodulation, as we call it, uses low-level energy to stimulate the periodontium. It increases your tooth movement, suggesting that the total treatment time ranges from 32 to 50 percent reduction in a non-growing adult when it's when it's measured versus a controlled side or at a control adult. And the photobiomodulation shows a faster mean rate of response than uh, the control group. So again, you know, this is not something new. It's a fifth generation, and um, it, it came from Canada. Now, one that's been around a little bit longer is the Acceladon product. Uh, this version of it is called the Aura. In this picture, you can see my, uh, my my adorable daughter Megan. This is my daughter Megan laying on the couch, uh, wearing an Acceladon, using it with Invisalign as she got retreated because she didn't wear her retainers. And, um, you know, of course, because I'm in the business, I'm, I would have a kid rebel on me. My daughter, who promised to wear her Invisalign aligners all the time, only wore them about nine hours a day. And she, it was I was lucky some days if I got nine hours because she was still in high school at the time and she was uh, overscheduled. And... Um, I don't, my experience with Invisalign is, is if you wear it nine hours a day, you cannot change your aligners um, routinely on a two-week cycle. And my daughter absolutely did a two-week cycle, and she did it about, like I said, about eight to nine hours a day. Probably some nights it was only five, and I'm convinced that the Accelerant uh, made it work for her. So, and this is a couple years ago. This is not recently, by the way. So uh, it, it's all good and fine. You know, again, this device is almost a thousand bucks, so it's expensive. And um, if if you look at how these soft pulse technology works, similar to how like an oral B toothbrush works, it's probably a little less in terms of um, its effectiveness in terms of the reach of the vibration. It's a very gentle um, uh, vibration. I don't know how else to explain it. And uh, it basically loosens teeth up. And we've seen also that when patients use an accelerant, uh, they will make their mechanics go quicker. So what's interesting about the accelerant specifically is um, it was designed for braces, but it works on a liner. So we can use it with any of the devices that we use in our practice. So, so that's very appealing. Now, if you're into invasive, you know, here's three options, you know. Option on the left is Wilkodonics, uh, also known as a corticotomy, where people do a full osseous flap, then they make cuts between the teeth, they decorticate the surface of the bone above the teeth using like a round burr, and then they smear the area with a freeze-dried, demineralized, 
cadaver bone, and then they close the site up and it heals very nicely. Piezo surgery is a little different. It's um, it's done straight through the tissue. I, I'm 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 aggressive, but I'm not that aggressive actually. So I don't have, I have no trouble doing you know um, full osseous surgery, especially when pa patients really um, have waited a long time to do this. They they do well when they have surgery. They heal very nicely. So when you look on the right side and you see the microosteo perforations, which is uh, excellent, what you'll see is um, it's a very nice option because it's clean and it's fast. So with with Excelinet now, uh, I'm sorry, with the Propel system, you now have three separate ways that you can do a microosteo perforation. The device on the left is a disposable device, and it's the original device, where when you um, on the top above the white ring, you can dial in the number of millimeters you want this screw to go into the bone, one, three, five, something like that, or I think it goes up to seven. Um, and then you just screw in, and then this clear plastic sheet that's covering the screw will pull back. There are some gauged lines on it so you know how deep you are. And as that pulls back and you hit your depth, a red light inside the handle will light up telling you you've, you've hit your depth and you can reverse. So um, so that was the original, the original handle, and it's uh, actually worked pretty well. I have no complaints about it. Then they came out with uh, an aluminum handle and a disposable tip that was a little bit more affordable. So for me, um, you know, because we set up uh, in terms of we use um, Hugh Freedy cassettes for all our instruments, we're kind of systematized. So when you say to someone, okay, you know, chair number three has a propel, you know, they go get our propel handle, they get a propel box, uh, they automatically pull the, the tracking label off and they give it to the front desk where we put it inside the chart. We have like a whole process of doing that. So I happen to use the middle system, that aluminum handle. Uh, it's, it fits really nicely in my hand. It's, uh, it went through several designs on it to get it right, but I, I feel that it's actually quite effective. The newest option you can have is you can get a, a, a rechargeable drill that will do all the turns for you. And the only thing you really got to do is just turn it on and hold it against the tissue, and it will literally drill the, the, the propel directly in for you. So I, I don't feel personally for myself that I need that. Uh, I'm sure at some point I'll play with it and try it. Uh, I've seen it a couple times, but uh, I personally like the feel of knowing that I'm in the bone because you can determine based on how the screw tip is going into the bone whether you have type 1 through 4 bone. And that will determine uh, maybe to the effect of at least I think how deep and how many perforations I want to go. So when the bone's extra hard, I know I'm going a little deeper and I might put an extra perforation or two in on a case. So microosteal perforations have um, really a, a minimal amount of uh, damage, so they're actually quite quite easy to do. Patients uh, go home, you know, an hour later, they usually feel fine. They're a little sore. Uh, we give them some Tylenol, but beyond that, they tend to do quite good. And um, what's what's important for me is uh, from the patient's benefit, it's um, it's easy to do and they're relatively comfortable. So for us, it, it keeps our cases going nicely on on track. And it's not a big deal to add it into my day. So how we do it is uh, we figure out exactly where we want to, you know, map the area for the trauma. I happen to use a chlorhexidine rinse in the area. Uh, I, I happen to like a product called Concepsis from Ultradent. It's uh, chlorhexidine and a little syringe. You know, the syringe people. So, uh, so I'll we'll put a tack on it, a topical anesthetic. We'll let it numb up for five to seven minutes. We'll rinse it off. I may give them an infiltration depending on where it is and, and how um, excited, meaning nervous, the patient is. Uh, I don't want a patient ever to tell me they feel anything. So I want to make sure that the topical really knocks out the surface area and makes it numb. And then we go, we go ahead and we, we micro-perforate the areas. 
So for us, I would say most patients will get perforated one to two times. Um, most I've ever done so far has been three. And typically between the teeth, you'll see between two and three microosteal perforations. It really depends on what kind of access you have. And uh, if a tooth is small like an incisor, a lower incisor, you're only going to get two. You know, if a tooth is big like a canine and you got a lot of surface area, you might be able to get three. The range uh, around that perforation is anywhere between six and ten millimeters. So if you damage the, you micro perforate the area or damage it, which is really what it is, there's a circle that goes around it, and that diameter of the circle, not the radius, but the diameter of the circle is between six and ten millimeters, which means your radius is between three and five millimeters. So the farther back you go in the mouth, the deeper you basically want to go. And the osteoclastic effect of the damage from microosteal perforation will start about a day after you perforate the area, and it will go for up to three months. So you just have to kind of be the shepherd of the treatment here, and you have to decide when it's appropriate to do a little bit more uh, osteoperforations. So you're going to use your x-ray. You're going to study the area. You're going to swab the area to disinfect it. In our case, sometimes we'll even put a NOLA, which is a mouth prop on them. Then you're going to go and you're going to you're going to screw into the bone in between the teeth, making sure to visualize where your root would be. Plus, in our case, we use a CAT scan. We want to make sure that if you feel like you think you're hitting the tooth, which is why I'm not so keen on using a drill. If you think you feel like you're hitting the root, you can either back it up and re re-angle it and or you can just stop and take it out but you don't have to necessarily just keep drilling and make the patient feel like well you know it's it's my way or the highway you know this is just a surface scratch it's really what a, what a microosteal perforation is so regardless of which handle you use or whether you use the rechargeable drill it doesn't really matter what is important is that you kind of have an idea where you want to put your perforations you decide how many perforations you want to use and you have to decide how deep they're going to be. And then you kind of go to town from there. So whether it's palatal or buccal, I don't expect that you're going to see. And you can see like this image down below here, my arrow's right on it. That's like probably five minutes after I did my perfs. You know, I, you know well, this is what it'll look like. Some people bruise a little bit easier, and you know they may look a little bit worse. But generally speaking, you tell people within 14 days, all the imagery of the bruising should be gone, and you know the canker sores will be gone, and and they'll be in good shape. So if you would would see this image, this this image suggests. As you go farther back into the mouth, it gets a little bit deeper. And then uh, as you go farther forward, it's going to get more shallow. So I, on a canine, I almost always will put three perforations. Everywhere else, I tend to do mostly two. And that can be either vertically or it could be like in the shape of a triangle, as you see between the the canine and the first bicuspid on the lower right. What's most important, and you got to remember, three or four teeth can oftentimes set the pace for your entire case. So when you have teeth that have rotations of more than 30 degrees, this is what you need to pay attention to. This is one of my few learning lessons here that I really want to drive home. If you have severe rotations, propel the teeth. I mean, it's just, just do it. I mean, it just makes life much, much, much easier. Make sure people don't take Advil or leave. Give them the little card which has the instructions. We literally staple a Tylenol in a bag to the card, and we give it to the patient. And we say, you know, in a couple hours, you can take two more. And it's only a couple minutes of your day. It's nothing crazy. So let's look at some clinical cases. I want to close the night out by looking at two clinical cases, the first of which, and I apologize if you've seen this before, 
is my very first Propel case. This was my learning lesson that made me really fall in love with this product because this is as honest as it gets. It's a class three subdivision on the left side. It's a unilateral Brody bite, meaning there's no occlusion at all on the left side of the arch. The lower teeth are trapped entirely inside of the upper teeth. There's no occlusal contact. So the facial surface, the buccal surface of the lower teeth are against the lingual surface of the upper teeth. Now this is a kid who suffers from moderate upper and lower crowding. He's got an adequate um, overbite and overjot. In fact, he's got an underjot, if you will. And he's got a complex crossbite that involves multiple anterior teeth. So when I met him, um, based after you know doing a patient interview with him and his parents, I decided I'm going to keep it simple. This isn't exactly ideal, but I wanted to do a unilateral extraction and uh, comprehensive orthodontics. And we we're going to take the tooth out and close the space. So my treatment plan required two rounds of Propel. And I probably waited too long to do my first round of Propel, just so you know. I, uh, I pulled the tooth out for him because they didn't have a, a family dentist. Uh, and I, this is the first time I pulled the tooth in probably 20 years, and like a real tooth, and um, put his braces on and propelled them all in a single day. So, you know, that, as an orthodontist, I don't do that very often. You know, like I said, first time in 20 years. So here he is at the beginning, and you can look and you can see the unilateral crossbite. You can see the anterior crossbite as well. And um, he's molar angle classification 3, so that cusp normally would be sitting in the groove over here. It's off about 5 millimeters. And my goal was not to change that. My goal was just to change the anterior and leave the molars where they were at. So here's the occlusal view showing the dysmorphic arch form between his upper and lower arches. And I think it was, um, it, this was a very real case. I mean, like, it, it was a pretty, you know, if you're going to test something, this was, this was worth, like, prove it to me. And, and I threw a very real hard case at it. So this is what he looked like the day we put his braces on. This is immediately after we extracted a premolar and we did the propel. So you can see the little bullet style or the target style marks from my uh, original uh, propel device. And there's probably about six perforations there maybe. So I really I decimated the extraction site pretty hard and I went all the way back to the mesial of the first molar. So it's really the injury site's not very big. And that was one of the things I'm showing you that I wasn't trying, I, I don't think I knew what to expect, so I kept it very conservative. So my second, my second application wasn't until month number five. I waited too long. So this is one of my errors, okay, because I didn't really understand what to do. And, and even though I understood, and I understood how to use it, I didn't use it properly. So here I am at month number five. Now you can see I'm a little more aggressive now. So you can see I've got a perforation between, that's the first molar and the second by. Here's my extraction site. You can see my perforations. You can see perforations all the way along the mesial of the canine as well, because I'm pulling this kid into an overbite now. So this was the beginning of month number five. And then by month number 10, I went from this to this. So I was pretty pleased. This was a uh, bracket here is innovation or empower. It's one of the two. I use a combination of both. Um, and you know, for ten months, I felt like, wow, two two applications of the microosteo perforations. This felt pretty good. He was pretty he was pretty pleased with the result. The parents were tickled to death. And when you when you look and you see, you know, what we achieved here in in ten short months, I wasn't even a year into the case and. They effectively thought I was finished. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, my extraction site's not even closed all the way. And and I'm still trying to put some function on top of that second by cuspid on the left side. So I had more space to close. But this was a nice progress point for us to take some records. And you can see that the arch form was recovered. He was nicely broadened out on the lower because he was in that, that failed relationship on the left side there. Um, and on the upper where the lateral was, 
like today I would know, okay, you know, I could have propelled that upper right lateral and canine. I didn't in this case because I just wasn't really thinking, but today I would because now I know what to expect. So at 17 and a half months, I finished my arch form. We were pretty good. When, when you look and you see how he finished, you know, uh, hopefully this is going to come through. You can, you can see the stages. That's the beginning. That's month five. That's month 10. That's month 12. And that's finished at month 17. Not a perfect result, but a, quite an acceptable result. And both the patient and the parents were incredibly happy with this result. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, I have to say it's not my best work, but it's it's good work. And it um, it was important to understand that, um, it, you know, we were done 25% ahead of time because I told them it was going to take two years because I didn't know what to expect. So financially, what that added up to for me was uh, I earned about 50% more money per month. So, you know, and, and I was pleased with that. So what I learned was Propel not only made my case go better, gave the patient a better experience, but I actually made money because it got me done quicker, but my fee didn't change. So that was that was a big learning lesson. So I had an, an increased earning of 38%, and, and as a result of that, my chair is now open five months earlier from when I expected to be finished. So my next case can start five months earlier. So that's really where you make your money. Second case I'm going to show tonight, and then we'll go through some questions here. And if you do have questions, all you got to do is go in your chat bar, and you can um, throw down some questions, and I'll, I'll just read everybody's questions. As, uh, oh, we don't have any questions right now. Okay. But um, if you have any questions, just feel free to put something in the chat bar on your screen there. And then I'll just read them and, and address them as we feel um, fit to do so. So, uh, so again, this was this was pretty effective. So the second case I want to show you is a completely different case, and this could be a case in any of your offices. This is a 25-year-old healthy male missing a lateral incisor, and this is as real as it gets. When you see these records, you're going to understand exactly why I put it in here. He had minimal upper and minimal lower crowding. He had a uh, 50% maybe 60% overbite. He was missing the upper lateral incisor and he had a retained cuspid and he wanted to do a dental implant. So when he came in and he talked to me, I really thought he was a plant. I thought somebody had sent him into my office just to see how I'd respond like a professional patient and because <laughs> he was asking these questions that were just like too perfect, like somebody had coached him. Uh, or maybe he did, I don't know. I mean, he just went online and he read, and, you know, when he came and he found me, and, you know, it's all been good. So I'm going to show you um, his case to the point where we got the implant in. So here he is at the presentation, nicely class one, deep bite. He's got a nice diastema between his centrals. Um, he's never had orthodontics before. And this tooth right here is a deciduous cuspid. Here's his real cuspid in the lateral incisor position. And those are my favorite cases because you know that the quality of the bone around the cuspid, the permanent cuspid, is going to be very good. So when you pull that tooth backwards and you distalize it, it should leave a very nice implant site. It should need very little bone. So in our scenario here, then, uh, this is how he started. And if you look at the panorex of how he started, you could literally see on the panorex at the root of the canine, this is the number three tooth, is directly next to the number one tooth. and these Teeth are relatively speaking parallel. Okay, this is a pretty upright canine. So if we can get this tooth to go straight back, then we have enough room to place a dental implant, and then we'll have an ideal occlusion. So being that we use uh, cone beam models, uh, I have a surface model showing how he started, and you can see on the surface here how thin the bone is around this canine. Now, the canine wasn't bone, but there wasn't a lot of bone on it. So I always was told, well, if the canine comes in at the lateral incisor, you won't need a bone graft. Well, when you see a model like this, that puts new meaning as to why you actually do need a bone graft. So I started thinking to myself, oh, my God, there's really not a lot of bone here. i got to be careful because if I go to pull the tooth back, I could very easily push 
the canine out of the bone. So I talked him into Propel for safety reasons, not for speed. But I said to him, it's likely that if I'm correct, your case will go faster. He was all for that. So this is the day we start his case. And yes, this is the second case I'm showing you where I pulled the tooth. I pulled his baby canine um, just because his dentist was really far away. He talked me into doing it. It wasn't a big deal to do. So we extracted the baby canine. We immediately propelled his his uh, extraction site, and the photo of it looks like this. And there's a you know propel there. There's a propel there. There's a propel there. There's a propel there. There's a microosteal perforation there, MLP, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, we did several MOPs right around this canine on the day we put his braces on. So at six months, I take an x-ray. Things on the lower are going fine. Take a look at this. I've got a tooth bonded in the, into the position here already. I'm six months out. My roots here are relatively parallel. That that's incredibly impressive if you do orthodontics. So I was very impressed with that. And then I just had to distalize this thing. So it took me two more months to get them ready. So roughly speaking, six weeks later, we take some more photos to show where he's at. You can judge for yourself. Here he is on the day they did the bone graft. So not only did I put a pontic on him, but as you can see from my photos, I actually made a little too much room medial to the canine for the implant side. But I'd rather have too much than too little bone, and I'll close it down, and in the process of closing it down, I'll make it the right size. So he gets this bone graft done. And then, you know, once once he's all healed, then then we decide, okay, you know, he's ready now to to place the dental implant. So we cut the arch wires, and now we send him off to oral surgery to get the implant placed. And as you can see here, the right lateral incisor is actually a peg lateral. So we're going to increase the size of the right lateral, and we're going to place an implant at the left lateral. And we're going to get both laterals ultimately done at the same time in terms of restorations. Now, here's the eye opener that I was just absolutely shocked by. Here's the actual surgical pictures taken the day they go to place the implant. And you can see how little bone is around this canine. There is just no denying the fact that this tooth is just floating in nothing. And yet, no endo, no discomfort, no worries. So I'm having this whole thing grafted at this point when they place the fixture here for safety reasons. So my lesson that I want to really drive home is the what if. What would have happened had I not done Propel? So you can see in seven months, I was really seven and a half months, I was good to go. But at the same point in time, I don't know, there wasn't a lot of bone on that tooth. So at this point, I want to conclude the, the first webinar. I want to address some questions. So if you got some questions, feel free to write them in right now. Um, and then I really, on the next webinar, I really want to mostly do cases, like all kinds of cases. And I'm going to really just try to address any questions you have. And, and, and depending on, you know, what those questions look like, we can go ahead and, and literally, um, you know, discuss them openly on the webinar here. So just give me a moment here as I maneuver my windows a little bit. I just got to break this thing out so I can see my questions. There we go. 
Okay, so um, so one of the questions from Iris is, and let me move my thing. What's the dialogue that I have with the patient or parent to get them to agree to propel, and when do we talk about it? Okay, that's, thank you, Iris. That is just an absolutely fantastic question. So I try to bring all these things up the day we talk about mechanics. So really, for me, I like to talk about mechanics in my consult on the first day. And I, I try to give people as much of an understanding as possible. So if I think that I'm in an area where the bone's going to be tenacious, just like that last case that I showed you, that we're doing an implant, I'm going to bring it up right away from a safety standpoint. And one of the things I believe in is um, I believe in the theory that Costco uses where when you walk around the Costco store, they're always giving away food and feeding you for free. In my office, when you come in and you look at orthodontics, we have a lot of devices on the counter for you to play with. We have study models, we have skulls, we have appliances, and yes, we have fake jaws with a propel on the counter. And we let people understand that this is what it looks like, this is how big the micro-osteoperforation is, this is how deep it's going to be. We show them it's like nothing. So I literally say to people, um, I'm a little worried about the tenacity of the quality of the bone here. You know, your tooth can get injured if it's, if it's in very thin bone and we're moving it far to set up for an implant or something like that. So I would like to prep the bone that's what I say. We say we prep the bone so that your tooth will move easier and you'll have less pain because that's literally what happens. The patient has a better experience. It doesn't hurt as much, and it's easier to move the tooth. And I think, um, I think most people really appreciate that. Okay, so Sonny's got a question. Is there any increased root resorption in Propel cases? To be perfectly honest, I've never seen any root resorption, and I've probably done in excess of 250 to 300 propels probably, and I've never seen root resorption once. So so I, I would give it a thumbs up. I don't think there's any studies indicating that. Um, if anybody has had a problem with Propel and they have had root resorption, I would sure like to know about it. And I would love to see uh, an image, film, photo, anything. Uh, so that's a good one. In an open bite adult case, would you place a micro osteo perforation on the palatal or the lingual as well as the buckle, or is placing them on the buccal side enough? That comes from Mark Tannenbaum. Okay, Mark. So. Quite honestly, you're going to see two really massively corrected open bites in my next webinar. Uh, one will be mechanics to intrude a molar, and one will be mechanics to extrude the anterior, and specifically only the upper. So, um, you know, every case has a different diagnosis. Um, I would tell you that. In general, I don't think you always have to do the palatal. I rarely do the palatal. And my logic is, is if I think I had a scar, the or you know, MOP, perforate, whatever you want to call it, if I thought I had to prep the, the lingual surface of the bone, I probably instead would just go deeper. So rather than do another injury site, I would just keep pushing through from the buckle all the way to the palatal because it's effectively the same thing, because you have a radius of anywhere between 6 and 10 millimeters. I think that would, that would probably be enough. But don't be afraid to do the lingual. I definitely do the lingual. There's no reason why you can't. It just tends to be more bleeding on the lingual, so you just got to be careful about that. Um, here's another question. If you didn't use Propel in the last case, what would I have expected at the labial when I retracted the cuspid? I probably would have expected I could have killed the cuspid because that was a really big distance. And the thing about it is, I won't I won't take that chance anymore. If I'm if I'm retracting a tooth in an entire position, I automatically propel now. I don't even give the patient an option. And if they say, well, I don't want to pay for it, I'll do it for free. 
I won't tell them that, but I'll, I'll build it into my case fee somehow because that propels screw tips just over 100 bucks. If it means that I can get retracting a canine done in three months or four months or six months versus nine to 15 months, absolutely worth every penny to me. And if I can do it and not injure the tooth or cause endo, it's even more valuable to me. So I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. I always have problems with doing propel in the molar area. Yeah, you and me both. Stretching the cheek and turning the applicator is quite a struggle. What's been your experience? Okay, that is a fantastic question. Thank you, Anthony. So one of the things I've learned is if you, you, you kind of have to be ambidextrous about this, right? So you've, you've put a bunch of topical in there, you've given them some Novocaine on top of that, then you swab them with an anesthetic. I then take my, I'm a righty, so I take my left hand and I take my index finger and I push it down in the vestibule. Like if I'm, if I'm working around the lower left, let's say buccal segment, I stretch the mucosa. And I try to stretch the mucosa down into the vestibule so that the mucosa won't get stuck on the screw so that when I propel the area, the mucosa doesn't wrap around the propel bit. If you just go right up against the flabby mucosa and you start screwing it, yeah, it's a real mess. you got to learn to put pressure on the tissue and stretch it, and the lack of the flaccid tissue will allow me to perforate quick and easy and cut. The hardest place to perforate for sure is going to be your, your lower molar region. It's the only place for sure I would say if you had one of those rechargeable drill drivers that they sell, that would be the place to try it. And I'm sure if you call your Propel rep, they'll come in and let you use it when you want to do a lower posterior region. The only reason why I really ever do lower posterior region is if I'm intruding a tooth or if I'm uprighting a tooth. In both situations, I now do Propel. Uh, you'll find in my office, I Propel a lot, probably daily. You know, and, um, and, I, and on our next webinar, I'm going to show you a very tenacious problem when you have a uh, over-erupted lower incisors, and you know how small they are, when you go to Propel, uh, you have to be comfortable with your discomfort. Like, if you do it right, the Propel screw will literally push your incisor slightly apart. You'll see a diastema form between the teeth, and then when you remove your Propel, they'll come back together. So that's how you know you're not doing any damage to the teeth, because the, the, the screw is just going between the teeth and pushing them apart. And, and that's a really tough thing to get comfortable with. Here's another question from Rod. Have you ever encountered excessive bleeding using MOP? Yes, sir, I sure have. Um, for patients who do not appear to need a preemptive bone graft, how do you select Wilco versus Propel? That's Scott. Okay, so let me ask, answer Rod's question really quickly. So, um, so number one, I have Viscostat in my office, which is a, a thick anti-bleeding slash coagulant. And if, if I had someone who's bleeding a lot, I will give them some more anesthetic because, you know, the vasoconstrictor constrictor from septicane should get it to slow down. And then on top of that, I'll oftentimes use a, uh, a stringent But usually I find that when I swab the area with the uh, chlorhexidine, the chlorhexidine tends to get them to clot. So I've, that's one of the reasons why I really favor the chlorhexidine. Sorry, if you hear the vacuums in the background, the, the cleaning crew is at work. So, uh, so that's how I, I handle the bleeding. When I'm done, I then take a cotton roll dipped in chlorhexidine, and I pack it between the, the vestibule, between the, the mucosa of the cheek and the area where I propelled, and I let it sit there for about three to five minutes. And then I usually take that out, I'll wipe them down with a wet gauze, uh, I don't ask them to rinse because, you know, there's an aftertaste with chlorhexidine. And um, I've had very good luck. I just haven't really had a lot of bleeding problems. Uh, let's see what else we got here. So one of the questions is coming from Scott. How do I decide when to use Wilkodonics and when, when to use Propel? So first of all, Wilkodonics is very expensive. You know, it could be $6,000 plus. So 
Uh, Wilco is really designed, in my mind, oftentimes for people who need bone. You know, you're going to grow bone with Wilcodonics. You won't grow it vertically, but you'll grow volume of bone, uh, especially if you've got a really good surgeon with really good hands who knows their science that uses, you know, all the fancy stuff like BMP and all this other stuff. So, um, so it really has a lot to do with uh, the amount of tooth movement we're doing, uh, what's going in afterwards, are we creating implant sites, uh, are there vertical defects, you know, have they, were they really like super bad in terms of pockets and stuff like that, are we, you know, are we doing a surgical, like, a, like an orthodontic um, extrusion slash extraction to become a surgical site? You know, that's when we start looking at Wilcodonics. Uh, and, and I'm lucky enough that I've got three, three very, uh, very healthy perio practices that are each independently, you know, very, very large that just refer to me as their only orthodontist. So uh, I tend to see a lot of damaged cases. And, you know, these people are very motivated to save their teeth. So I've had good, good success with Wilco, and uh, I'm proud to say that I'm friends with Tom and Bill Wilco, and I think they're, they're marvelous guys. They're smart. Uh, they're funny, uh, very humble. I think, I think their technique is really great, and, you know, going to Erie really changed my practice. So we, we do a lot of Wilco. Like, we do a lot of Wilco. Um, okay, so doesn't extraction sites produce the same stimulation as Propel? So should you defer your Propel for 6 to 10 weeks, or do you charge once and every... Uh, so, okay, so the question from George was, is uh, when it comes to an extraction site, do I defer for 6 to 10 weeks? And the answer is, um, it's not quite the same, actually. So we actually Propel, you, we really want to just destroy the extraction site if possible. Like, if you would see how the Wilco brothers do it, they actually remove the buckle wall. Um, and I'm not that crazy, but we perforate the extraction sites and we're really hard on the bone in the extraction sites because we really want to create a traumatic zone where the bone is super soft. Um, and it just goes easier and faster and the patients are more comfortable after we do this. So I, I, I would personally suggest to you um, to try it because I really do think it makes a lot of sense. To the point that I've I, you know, if, if I got a small extraction site, like a lower incisor or something like that, I'm, I'm very keen on offering that to a lot of people now. Um, do I charge once or do I charge every time? So I, th I think that's, thank you, Ryan, that's a really good question. I would tell you that um, it, you got to be careful of charging too many times because you're going to look like you're trying to, nickel and dime people. So I have a flat fee for Propel. I think I charge like $450 for it. And I just tell people if, you know, if we go beyond this and we need a little bit more, we'll tell you, we'll charge you if we have to. I, I believe if the Propel is working, I'm, I'm willing to give it away after they pay $450 just so I can get out of Dodge quicker and get, get through with my case safer. So I don't, you know, I don't worry if I'm going to lose 100 bucks on a Propel tip. I just want to know that I'm done six to eight months faster. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I flash my post-op slide again? Sure. Let me back that up. This is the post-op slide. And you can, you can truly see, like, especially in the left image here, I mean, look how beautifully parallel these roots are in seven months. I mean, that was... These teeth were next to each other before. So, you know, that, that was impressive. I was, I was very pleased with that. Are there any cases that they absolutely contraindicate for Propel? Oh, I'm sure there's lots. Um, you, you know, if there's, you know, like bleeding issues, um, you know, people who really need bone grafts, you know, that, that's effectively a trauma. You know, so uh, a lot of times, you know, on the Wilco cases, you know, I'll just do Wilco instead because, you know, it's it's like we've gotten two ankylosed teeth to move. We haven't gotten them to move fully, but we definitely got them to move. So, and there's no question. Like I got I got a molar that was that had primary failure to erupt. To I got it to erupt about three millimeters. 
So I was incredibly impressed with that. Um, you know, and that'll be crowned now. Now you can crown it. So there, there are things. You know, it's not a miracle. You know, it, it it's just basic trauma. You know, what what it is though is convenient, and it and it's packaged in a way that you can use it in all kinds of different ways. And I think that's what's most impressive for me is that it's um, not necessarily um, a hard thing to. Um, it's it's not a hard thing to utilize, and it and it's not scary looking, which is the other part that kind of makes a lot of sense. Because I think when something is scary looking, um, it it becomes a problem, and it and it and it, and it really uh, will become an issue. Okay, here's a question I think I missed. I understand why you wanted to propel the mesial of the canine in the second case. But do we really need to propel an extraction site, or is the extraction site itself enough to stimulate the cytokinase? So here's the thing. If you have an extraction site, you're going to go at your normal rates. But when you're talking about an adult, and they have a low level for discomfort, part of what you're doing here isn't extracting a tooth. Part of what you're doing is customizing the physiology. You, you have to have a new mindset here. You have to be able to tell the patient, I'm going to give you a better experience. They don't know what it's going to be like to have orthodontics with an extraction, but they do know what it's like when they're uncomfortable, and they're going to complain. Now, coming from a position where I'm almost 65% adults, and I mean, I have some pretty hard adult cases here, I'll do whatever it takes in order to make a case uh, treat out easier and faster. And I don't think it's unreasonable to think that sometimes um, it just, you know, it, it, it just warrants it. You know, the thing about it is, if you want to do your own experiment and you got bilateral extractions, you can propel one side and leave the other side alone, and you can prove it to yourself. It's already been done, okay? That's what the whole NYU study was. They microperforated the whole thing. So, and it showed 2.3 times faster, you know, twice as fast. So, the answer is yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're looking for speed, you need to propel. If you're not looking for speed, but you're looking for comfort, yeah, <laughs> you still need to propel. If you don't care about the comfort and you don't care about the speed and you think there's enough bone where the tooth will be safe, then don't propel. You know, we've been doing it that way forever. This is just another twist, and it just makes things go a little bit easier. So I think in that regard, it, it's all good. Um, put back the slide with the patient's instructions. Sorry about that. I mean, somebody wanted to see the patient instructions. Well then, it's coming. Uh, I believe it was the, the one I just went past. Here you go. So, um, the one thing that may screw you up is um, if you have a patient on a biphosphatate type of a drug. Now, that will change bone physiology. So is there a time when you don't want to propel? Yeah, that would be one of them. You know, someone who's got known osteoporosis, known systemic problems where you know their turnover rate is different, I'd be careful not to propel them. But, you know, when you talk about a healthy individual, I think this will be good. Okay, so it is Tuesday night. It's 8.30 my time. I took you guys a half hour past when I promised I would jump off, and I certainly didn't uh, intend to do that. Uh, next time is a different type of a seminar. It will be uh, much more case selective. I'm going to show you lots and lots of cases, open bites, um, crowded cases, spaced cases, uh, implant cases, you know, and, and I'll try to vary it up a lot so that you can appreciate the range, including uh, open bites with clear aligners, uh, just some, some odd types of things that um, will work well for you. But before I close, I want to show you just a cute little video. I'm just going to have to get out of this really quick.
Let me see if I can do this. Give me a second here. And I'll show you just, um, this is just something I put together. It's one of my patients that um, we, uh, we propelled. She was getting married. So she had a very real reason why she had to uh, get done quickly. And I told her I couldn't do it because she waited too long. So she only gave me approximately like, uh, I don't know, I, I, I want to say 40, 40 uh, less than four months to, to treat her out. So I said, well, fix your front teeth. And, and then after we fix your front teeth, we'll take everything off for the wedding. And then after the wedding, we're going to go ahead and we'll finish the case. So this is what my patient looks like um, on the day I put her braces on. And, and this is less than four months from her her wedding, okay? So here we go. So we topicaled her with tack, and you can see my 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 propel is literally sitting stuck between her front teeth. We're just rinsing her off. I'm I'm just moving the camera around. So so now this is live. You're you're watching me physically go very aggressively deep between her front teeth. She's got a big old diastema. You'll see it in a second. And you'll notice I support the teeth with my opposite finger so that, because you'll feel a lot of pressure between your teeth. It's very uncomfortable if, if you're in the right spot sometimes. So I, I get that screw in pretty deep and then I actually wiggle my handle to make sure I, I really irritate the bone. And I pull it on. You can see we're just kind of rinsing her off as we go uh, so she doesn't look too gory. Um, and I'm just, I'm going from premolar to premolar in this case. And you can literally, you can just see how fast it takes me to screw in and, and pull it out. So it's, it's nothing real crazy. You can, you can see she bleeds a little bit, right? So that's a pretty healthy diastema. That's a deep, deep bite, right? You can see from the sides how low those teeth are. And we'll look at this case in detail next time. So here she is eight weeks in, second round of Propel. Here she is two weeks later. You can see how small that diastema is. And I have not done a phrenectomy on her, by the way. So I had her finish 17 weeks in time for her to get married. And she never had to airbrush anything for her wedding. So for four months, you know, I think that was that was a pretty good deal, and she was happy, and she's uh, she's spreading the word about us. <laughs> Very happy. So I'm going to stop with that. Just showing you that um, there's lots and lots of applications for this stuff. I hope um, I've shown you that to some extent, and hopefully, maybe you know. You'll think about this a little bit over in the coming months. If you know, and if you find you have a case you want to try and you've never done it before, please feel free to call a rep. The rep will come to your office. They'll buy your staff lunch. They'll 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 literally hold your hand when you do your first case. They'll tell you everything to do. It's real straightforward. It's nothing crazy. Um, it, maybe I make it look more scarier than it really is. I, there's just not a lot to this. There really isn't, and um, it's been a it's it's been a very nice augmentation to my practice and uh, hopefully you all will, will find the thing. So uh, I hope you have a good night and then uh, if you have any questions feel free to email me any questions directly and my email you can just write this down is Dr. Neil D-R-N-E-I-L at getitstraight.com. All right have a good night and I will talk to you guys again right before the AAO back in uh, April. Take care.